Welcome back, Junkie. We are so excited for today's episode because we have the honor of speaking with Dr. Ruth Roberts about an incredibly important topic, one that is really causing, well, partially causing a crisis in veterinary medicine, and that is cultivating a relationship with your veterinarian. If you're here, If you're listening to this, then you're probably like us. Pam, Janet, and myself, we completely understand how difficult it is to find a veterinarian that we can trust, that we can have open, honest conversations with, and that doesn't look down on us and belittle us for choices outside of the box of traditional veterinary medical care. Dr. Ruth Roberts has been practicing veterinary medicine for over three decades. Of course, like many veterinarians, she wanted to become a veterinarian because of her love of pets as a child. And through vet school, she really found that, you know, what was in that box of traditional medicine that she was being taught wasn't going to cut it. Of course, she learned how to deal with the checkups and how to perform the surgeries, but she also knew that she needed to be an advocate for these animals because she's the one that they count on when they feel hurt or uncomfortable and they can't speak for themselves. So she realized that her textbook knowledge and the many years she spent practicing traditional Western veterinary medicine could only take her so far. And she was stuck in the middle of a whirlwind, as she calls it, of sickness, learning, healing, and ultimately change that had to happen. She began pursuing acupuncture and Eastern veterinary medicine at the Chi Institute in Florida, which opened up many avenues for her. Most importantly, she says, it revealed the healing powers of acupuncture as well as herbal and food therapy. She says, more than ever, the importance of diet became abundantly clear to me. Why is it that we only think of our health when it has already been debilitated? It doesn't make any sense. So paying very close attention to what our pets eat, to what fuels their body, is the first step in preventative care and maintaining good health. Ultimately, her desire is to help heal pets with the use of natural therapy as much as possible. Of course, in combination with traditional therapy, she is an integrative veterinarian after all. But we're here today to talk about cultivating a relationship with your veterinarian, preparing for veterinary visits. And you're going to hear firsthand from Janet uh, as she is just now navigating as we, as we're recording this she's only 1 month in to a very serious cancer diagnosis with her heart dog Hank and i was so glad <laughs> that Janet could join us today in meeting Dr. Ruth for the first time because Dr. Ruth was able to give her some tips and tricks and advice um, on how to move forward with this very rare form of cancer that her dog Hank has. So with that in mind, whether your dog has cancer today or not, or whether they're suffering from another ailment, and let's not forget about those kitty cats, of course, we talk about it all. We talk about trying to form really that relationship with your vet where you two can have open, honest conversations with each other, preparing for veterinary visits, especially in today's climate, because it's not all that easy and COVID made it so much worse. Uh, We also talk about vaccinations. We talk about food therapy. Uh, Janet and, and Ruth get to talk about a little bit about cancer therapy and moving forward when you know that traditional Uh, Western medicine isn't going to cut it, especially for a dog that was given one to three months to live. So with that, let's get right into today's episode. Thank you so much for being here. Share this with any and everyone you can, because this is one of the most important conversations we can be having right now um, between veterinarians and pet parents. So let's get it out there. And here we go. Let's talk to Dr. Ruth. (music) 
As a pet parent, you face more challenges with your dogs and cats today than ever before in history. What's the best food to feed? How do I prevent illness and help them live longer? Maybe you currently have a pet living with disease or behavioral issues and you need a different approach for success. Welcome to the Pet Health Junkies podcast. We're so happy you're here. Pam Roussel is a holistic health practitioner specializing in holistic health for animals. Janet Cesarini is a healthy pet store owner and advocate for health through nutrition. Jessica Fisher is a pet parent coach and positive reinforcement dog trainer. Join us as we share our stories, experiences, and all that we've learned to change the way we think about raising our pets. We're breaking it all down and making it simple by sharing how we help pet parents just like you every day. Because when we know better, we can do better. So today we have such an important topic, and I know we've all touched on it before with our our tribes, but cultivating a relationship with your veterinarian is what we decided to title this. And oh my goodness, are we ever having a crisis in veterinary medicine between pet parents and veterinary and veterinary staff in general? Um, it's tough right now. It's, it's troubling <laughs> in some instances. And yeah. While I know myself, Pam and Janet, we could all talk about this for days on end, we thought it would be best to get some veterinarians on here, people who have actually been practicing veterinary medicine for a long, long time, <laughs> to get their input on this very serious issue because we care so much about our pets and we need to be able to have a really good relationship with our veterinarian. So Dr. Ruth Roberts, thank you so much for being here with us. Yay. I am so delighted yes. to be here, Jessica, Pam, Janet. It's um, awesome that you guys are doing this and I hope I can give, give you and your listeners a little more information to, yeah, so fire away. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I know. I, I don't. I don't want to take the spotlight from anybody today because I know. I'm sure Pam, you have a ton of questions, but I know Janet. This has been very heavy on your heart lately um, because of some personal issues. Mm -hmm. So, do you want to start? Well, okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it it has been very heavy on my heart, and as a matter of fact. This morning, I have had um, communication with two of the vet clinics that I'm currently working with for my heart dog, Hank. Um, and I've not announced that Hank's condition to our pup squad, as we call our customers and, and followers, um, yet. But um, we are recording this during Pet Cancer Awareness Month, and I just found out a month ago that Hank has anal gland carcinoma, which mm. if, you know most of us laymen do not know um, about this type of cancer. It's one of the rarest, as I understand, Dr. Roberts. From what I've read, it affects less than 2% of um, canines. And... Mm -hmm. The age is between 10 and 11 years old, of which Hank is 10 and a half, and it came on very quickly, and we did not get a great prognosis, but um, two of the clinics that we are currently dealing with, um, they came about from me hoofing it, calling, researching, um, really interviewing and fielding different veterinarians and their their practice um, methodology, how it aligns with mine. And I mean, we spent, you know, the better part of three weeks putting together a literal team of which mm -hmm. I go into Round Rock, locally Georgetown, 30 minutes away, Salado, 45 minutes away to Harker Heights. And I have a consult, a consult consultative veterinarian in New York. And that's the team that I've been blessed to put together. Um, but it was a lot of work. And I'm fortunate to not have to 
go to a nine to five job where I'm answering to someone other than myself. I mean, I've have the team here at the store that keeps the store running because I have been so focused on getting Hank the care team that he needs. And so I went to the girls and I said, y'all, this is a, like you said, Jessica, it's a, almost like a crisis because, mm-hmm. um, and then to back it up and bring in another lovely couple. I was at a dinner Saturday evening for a fundraiser um, for Living Grace Canine Ranch. And we sat across from this lovely couple and they told me the story about their lab, who they had to put down. And when they told me why, my heart just broke because of what I know. And I know that these therapies, because Hank's getting a lot of alternative therapies in addition to Palladia, which is an oral chemo drug for those of you that, you know, I hope you never know what that is. Um, But he's getting various alternative therapies, holistic and Chinese herbs and oxygen therapy, um, B12 acupuncture. And then we're doing intravenous vitamin C therapy um, that goes next week. Um, but this couple, when they told me, I said, wow, you know, I know we could have helped them, but they felt like they had that one clinic that they could go to. Um, and if they had reached beyond that one clinic, everyone that practices around here almost is basically the same. So Dr. Mm -hmm. Roberts, you know, when the girls and I were talking about it and they were so receptive to it and said, you know, yeah, let's talk about it. We said, we really need help from the veterinary community to help. Um, pet parents know what questions to ask, to have the courage to ask questions. Um, Mm -hmm. The first oncologist that I visited with, as my husband sat there just staring into space, not really trying to process what he was being told or what we were being told, um, had I not known what I knew, I would have been in the same situation and I would not have been able to help Hank because she basically told us that um, he had a month to two months to live he, and that she was a realist and there was no therapy that was going to help him. And so I gathered myself and paused and I asked her to give me a referral to an integrative oncologist of which I was told they do not exist. <laughs> I was literally told that now Mind you, I'm blessed to know better, but 99% of the pet parent community probably does not know that. And so we were basically, we were being asked to um, put him on chemo and and that's that. And also, um, because I knew, otherwise I had been watching Dr. Karen Becker and um, Rodney's inside scoop of which we're all, you know, members. And it was, um, Dr. Uh, Kendra Pope. And I think Dr. Hazan, I don't know if I say her name, right. But they're mm-hmm. integrative. Yeah, Trisha Hazan, yeah. Yes. It, they're integrative oncologists. And the day that I found Hank's tumor, I was listening to that webinar. So mm-hmm. thank God I knew that. <laughs> so I said, okay, um, thank you. And then I said, what would you, recommend as far as diet and I, I kind of lined up but at this point I kind of knew where she was going to go and she suggested that he be on a high carbohydrate diet and so I was biting my tongue and swallowing the blood <laughs> <laughs> and I felt like this is not my time to educate her on what carbohydrates turn into and what they feed you know carbohydrates and sugar feed cancer. And that's the opposite of what I want to do. So she was not on board with our, you know, raw food diet. Um, we, we clearly, this is my last point. We clearly were not cut from the same cloth and she was not a good fit for Mm -hmm. the direction that my husband and I have to go in order to try to increase the longevity and the quality of Hank's life. So you know, you have two types of pet parents, one that's informed and one that is not, maybe not so informed. And they don't know what to do other than to take the advice of the one vet they've always gone to or the one that vet that is available. Mm-hmm. And that's heartbreaking. It, and it, it is, but, and you know, so before, before I throw my profession under the bus, I, here's a couple <laughs> of things that 
<laughs> and, I, and I'm not, I mean, I, I'm saying that jokingly, but there is a huge crisis because the, the number of pets that need care far outmatches the number of veterinarians, just general okay. practice veterinarians. And then when, because the, we, you know, veterinarians are trained to refer anything that's even slightly complicated to an internist, to an oncologist, to a cardiologist, all the stuff that didn't exist when I started practicing, except for at the teaching universities. Uh, that's where the, the disconnect is, is that the local vet doesn't have the, the skills to really help. And furthermore, I think with this was coming with even before COVID, but during COVID, they just are so overwhelmed. And unfortunately, a lot of the veterinary support staff were getting, you know, people were literally uh, threatening them physically, emotionally, uh, you know, verbally. And so there's a huge disconnect. Um, and anyone that could get out of the profession did. And so we went from a bad situation to a much worse situation. So the other problem is, is that medicine changes so slowly. Like I started mm -hmm. talking about leaky gut syndrome in 2006, and it was still fringe on the human side. And now there, I mean, you know, there's a zillion papers on gut health coming out, you know, every day. And in fact, there's a, there was an interesting one where they compared uh, the microbiome of dogs living in different parts of the world and found that pretty much they're all the same, which was interesting, except for U.S. dogs that are eating highly processed foods. So, you know, yeah. that's it's a huge problem. And I think the other issue is that veterinarians, to help kind of help us work through processes more quickly, we get trained to use flow charts. The issue is, is when you can't move off the flow chart onto the patient. And I think that's a massive problem too. And, it, you know, and it's nothing is one size fits all. And this is the problem is that we're, we're trying to make all of the, you know, the square pegs fit in the round holes and it's just not working. And that's mm -hmm. why the concept of personalized medicine has gained more credence on the human side because that's what they started realizing is that, oh, golly, there's a certain percentage of people that really do not do well when we give this drug, which is, say, the standard of care for heart disease. And mm -hmm. that happens for our, our pet patients as well, for dogs and cats. And there's just not even that concept in veterinary medicine yet. So there's a massive amount of problems. And there is a tremendous resistance to anything that is not um, evidence-based, let's say that. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, when you say, well, I'd like to incorporate this and that and the other, it, it, you, you know, you're getting hit with a brick wall. And, and that's not appropriate either. So, I mean, unfortunately, many of my colleagues are stuck in that mindset of doctor is God and what I say goes. So mm -hmm. Dr. Roberts, that you mentioned two things that exactly was our experience. We got the flow chart from our oncologist. Um, she was a 2020 graduate. So she graduated during COVID. She's relatively new, but great credentials. Um, lovely, you know, doctor, but at the same time, we could not rock off of the flow chart. And when I tried to go outside mm -hmm. the chart, it was like you said, I was trying to personalize it um, and bring in the studies that I had um, been researching. And the second thing you mentioned that we experienced was that's not evidence-based. And the girls yeah. know, I kind of went off and I said, how, how do we land in medicine whether it's human or pet medicine, um, how do we land in medicine and not realize that anything that's scientific was first anecdotal? And <laughs> so, because yeah, I well, was and, and so here's the real deal about evidence-based medicine. Less than 11% of evidence-based medicine uh, recommendations and standards of care 
are actually evidence based <laughs> or actually what? from double you know double blinded Blind. studies and and yeah. it's just it's really frustrating and so you know to to your point what happened for a lot of my consulting clients is that they'd go in and they'd talk to the doctor and they'd figure out what they could talk to the doctor about and get, you know, lab tests and things, whatever they needed to have done to make sure everything was working okay. And then they would talk to me about the other stuff. And unfortunately, just as with your experience with Hank, you, you've got, you know, five veterinarians or five people lined up to assist you with his care. Yeah. And that's, you know, it is the way it is, unfortunately. And I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. <laughs> Yeah. So, well, so to that point, what would you say to our listeners um, when they go in for an appointment so that they aren't kind of stuck in that flow chart um, and maybe the vet is backed up that day and in a hurry and has 15 minutes and how can our you know listeners make the most of the time with the vet? Because, and I feel that um, being prepared before you go in is the key to maximizing your time in front of the veterinarian and, you know, taking a notepad. And so what are like, if we had the top questions, um, and I'll, I'll tell you, I, I want to create a checklist that we can give to our customers here in the store. We can put online that says, these are some things that you may not, may not be on your radar that you need to talk to your veterinarian about. And one of them that I just found out with Hank's diagnosis is there's a test for vitamin D levels. And some of the studies I read show a correlation between a vitamin D deficiency and cancer. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. when it was not until I got to the oncologist and that was on my flip pad, she, did, she even she did not bring it up. And I said, what about vitamin D? And she said, oh, that's a great question. And if it's so great, sidebar, if it's so great, then why didn't she bring it up? Going back to, I brought it up and she said, there's a blood test for that. And then I, my next question was, if he's deficient, what do I do? Do I do, I'm going to use whole foods? And she said, well, there's whole foods, but of course doing that math magic and how many, <laughs> how much vitamin D is in each whatever food we bring in, that's one thing, or we have drops. And so he ended up being insufficient, which is one level above deficient for those of you that may not know. Um, and so he's insufficient. So he's getting oral drops once a day. And I'm, yeah. you know, I've never been asked or spoken to from a veterinarian standpoint about vitamin D in my life. Mm-hmm. It, and vitamin D is an interesting thing because there's several labs that do it. There's one lab that is notoriously inaccurate. Um, they also do a lot of cancer tests, which are also notoriously inaccurate. And I've actually had pet parents end up putting their dogs into a toxic situation with vitamin D. Mm -hmm. So we have to be, this is something we have to be super, super careful about. That's actually... Mm -hmm. Excess vitamin D is one of the big reasons for pet food recalls in the last 10 mm -hmm. years or so. So it is something that's super important, absolutely. And especially for a pet that has cancer, you know, autoimmune disease, that kind of stuff. But to your point, you know, what should you do getting ready for a veterinary visit? If you are going to a specialist because of a specific health condition, then spend some time researching that so you have a basic understanding of what that is. And a good place to start is the Merck Veterinary Manual online because at least you're going to get the conventional um, understanding of whatever that disease process is. And then from there, you can kind of build into others. You want to, when you're doing research, avoid sites that are you know trying to sell you a product basically and mm -hmm. um, that rely on testimonials to tell you how well this works against this specific condition because that's 
sometimes it's a great product, sometimes it's really not. And that would just break my heart when, you know, in my last brick and mortar practice or, or online, people would come with, you know, 17 supplements. And so it's hard to know, you know, what's what. So before you buy anything, do research, do the appointments, and then figure out what's appropriate. And, mm-hmm. and then, as you said, go with a notepad. Ask the doctor if it's okay to record the meeting so you don't forget anything. And I think that is really, really critical. Um, sometimes doctors get a little freaked out about that, but just, you know, tell tell her, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I'm terribly distraught. And I'm, I just want to make sure that I don't miss anything. And then also my husband wants to, you know, to listen in on what was said too. And then, you know, once you've done your research, you've got your notepad, have your list of questions. How, you know, how do you think this is going to go for Hank? What do you think our um, prognosis is, our survival time in the case of cancer? Um, do you think, you know, the medications will create side effects? What do you think the side effects will be? You know, so you've got all these questions laid out before you go into the appointment. Mm-hmm. I think that's super critical. Yeah. So what about the um, pet parent that's going in for their annual checkup? What, you know, what then radar and, and, and it, it depends. Has that pet had health issues in the past? Has it had GI issues? So if it's had ongoing health issues, then what I would suggest is again, research everything so that you know what, what to ask. If your pet's been healthy, wahoo, that's fantastic. Um, if, if the dog or cat is over Three, I would suggest doing at least baseline blood work because Mm -hmm. that way you're going to know what's normal for that pet and even earlier in life as well. Um, And then if you've seen a bump or a lump or something going on in an ear, again, write all that stuff down so you don't forget. I think that's what happens is we're waiting and waiting and waiting. The vet comes in and they're like whizzing through the exam and trying to get back out the door. So if you have this Mm -hmm. list of questions already written down, you can start, hey, wait a minute, doctor, let's have these questions and you can get through those a little bit more efficiently. But but you're right. I mean, a lot of what we end up doing, what I end up doing is coaching people how to deal with the next vet appointment. And and it's so it's such a needed, um, you know, service. Um, But and this is what happened. So, you know, all of our dogs are seniors. They have been blessed to have had healthy lives. They've never been on prescriptions, never prescriptive food. Um, they have been very healthy, and that's a blessing. And then we are stricken with this. Um, the Talk about senior pets. Um, in my experience and in, in our history, we were going twice a month. Um, to keep an eye on some lipomas, which we may want to talk about that because there's, I've experienced more vets that do not want to surgically remove them. And just recently with Hank's diagnosis, I've been, um, my latest integrative vet said, I would like to remove these two and see what may be going on here. Um, but she did a rectal exam. It was the first time again that a vet had performed a rectal exam on my dogs. So at what age does, should that happen? Do you recommend that that happen? And, and are there certain tests that as the pets become, you know, senior age, what should be on that notepad? I think... <laughs> You know, it's heartbreaking because I had, I can't tell you how many clients I had come in with dogs with chronic ear infections, and Mm -hmm. they'd never seen a veterinarian put notoscope in the dog's ear. So, (laughs) yeah, it's just like, really? Okay. So that's the thing, you know, know what the the components of a physical exam should be. They should look, and, and to be fair, there are certain pets that there are certain parts of the physical exam that are just not going to get done without sedation. Um, but, you know, they should have a complete exam of the mouth. The ears 
um, should be inspected with an otoscope to see if the middle ear is okay or not. The eye should mm. be inspected with an ophthalmoscope. Um, you know, the the vet should run their hands over the entire body, checking for lumps, bumps, also discomfort. And then, uh, you know, as far as rectal exams, that doesn't get done as frequently, partly because nobody likes to do it. But uh, but for pets that have had chronic anal gland issues, it's a great one. Anybody that's had lumps and bumps around the the rectal area. Fortunately, the majority of them are benign, but unfortunately, Hank is in that 2% of, of not benign. So these are all super important things, um, you know, making sure that the dog can walk okay, um, that there's no, you know, they're not listing to one side. So really just doing a very, and then obviously listening to the heart and lungs. So doing a very thorough physical examination. And there's a lot of a lot of that that just doesn't happen, sadly. And then as far as lab work, um, that's where things like uh, a thyroid panel to see, you know, for dogs that are starting to look a little not so good, they're gaining weight, hair coat doesn't look well. You know, we can use like a survey T4 test, but for dogs that are not looking quite right, I think a full panel is important. Chemistry panel, obviously, full urinalysis, uh, complete blood count to make sure red cells, white cells are all good there. And um, really, that's that's kind of where I would go for screening. Uh, and then looking at the dog's nutrition. Unfortunately, what that means for most veterinarians is, okay, he's over seven. Now he needs to go on a senior diet which is typically lower in protein and absolutely the last thing that needs to happen for aging pets. Yeah, so no that's the, that's the thing is that, you know, you, you have to get the information you can get from the veterinarian. And then sometimes you have to find someone else to help you yeah. figure out how to really optimize that pet's health. That's a great term. Does that make sense? Health. Yes. And I, I think, um, as you mentioned earlier, when we started talking, you know, how, you know, gut health used to be on the fringe. And now, you know, we talk about gut health all day long um, with our pet parents, our customers, and um, the getting a team consulting, you know, about nutrition, what, what would be best to optimize your pet's health. And, I feel like, you know, we're going more and more into whole foods and recognizing that pets, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with table scraps if, <laughs> if it's, you know, broccoli, kale, spinach, you know, if we healthy, you know, lean meats, but it's part if it's of it's real food. <laughs> yeah. Real, and it's real part food. Of balanced, you know, um, diet. So as we get it, a, we hear it a lot about, you know, oh, well, they never get table scraps. And I said, well, if you eat a healthy balanced diet, that would be very healthy for them rather than the box of biscuits that are shaped like a bone. Um, you know, so I, mm -hmm. that even having the, I, I know some of our, our customers avoid the conversation about food because there's such a gap between what um, traditional veterinary medicine believes and what, you know, the three of our clientele believe. So, um, yeah. And, and that's it. I mean, I think you, you have to, you have to choose your information source wisely. How about that? Yes. Yeah. That is so perfect. Yeah. And, but I think really what it all comes down to is, finding as a pet parent we have to we have to empower ourselves to learn more mm -hmm. and to know more and to do more and we have to find that balance between being respectful with our veterinarians because they do have knowledge that we don't and appreciating that and and appreciating them for what they can do for us the the physical exams the lab work the x-rays mm -hmm. and taking that along with creating a team of people for our health care professionals for our, our pets and taking that along with the knowledge that we gain ourselves 
Yeah. Like there's that balance there that we need to have. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's really, that's part of what personalized medicine is about as well is not only Mm -hmm. personalizing specific treatments, but also asking the patient. And in this case, the, the pet parent, the guardian to be responsible for the health of that individual. And that's, that's the thing that has really gone so awry in healthcare in the U.S. is that, you know, there's so many people that get um, knee surgeries, for instance, that probably wouldn't need them if they might lose about 15, 20 pounds. But because we don't want to change our behavior and our habits, we have mm-hmm. knee surgery. Or getting off we'll take process. the pill till we can get it. Yes. Yeah. 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 And that's it. I mean, I've been an advocate of whole food cooking for, well, I started it in, in 06, just as the first uh, pet food recall came in 2007. And that was illuminating the changes that I saw in animals that were eating whole, whole food diets. Oh. And mm-hmm. yeah, it's just tremendous. So it's, and that's actually what the microbiome um, responds well to is whole foods, real foods. Mm-hmm. So what would you um, say to our listeners regarding nutrition when they go in for that um, vet appointment and they want to have that conversation and it's, uh, it's leading up to the conversation and then, you know, it can go one of three ways one where it's just an emphatic no. Um, I literally was told I was going to kill Hank, literally, by continuing to feed him um, a gently cooked raw whole food diet. Um, <clears throat> so that's what that veterinarian said. Some will say, you know, go do what you think is best. I, I don't know a lot about that, you know, arena go talk to an independent pet store, go talk to a new pet nutritionist. Um, and then some will be completely open to, Oh, you raw feed. That's great. You know, your pet is in wonderful condition. I'm fine with whatever you're doing. So to have your, having the notepad walking in and you want to have the discussion about nutrition, what do we, how do we frame that? And then if we need to say, Oh my gosh, I have to back out of this. What would be a gracious way to back out of that? you're gathering information and so what i would say is don't take the answer personally yeah and that's Mm -hmm. the thing is that you know but 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 yes that's that's that is this person's answer and Mm -hmm. um you may do something in the future that will cause them Mm -hmm. to say oh maybe i ought to look into this because they see your pet down the road but go there for information and if you don't like the answer, don't take it personally. And I think that's what happens is that um, we don't recognize sort of the lack of knowledge, unfortunately, that many veterinarians have about uh, other ways to feed pets. Right. That's good advice to take in the information. And thank you. Yeah, I like that. Mm-hmm. And then you also know where that person is coming from. And so you know what more conversation you could have or not have. True. So same topic, same question, but different um, lane, flea tick and heartworm meds. <laughs> you know, that's it's a tough one. So I practice in South Carolina. Y'all are in Texas. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. You know, sometimes you just got to use them. I mean, when stuff starts to get out of control, it's terrible. And tragically, uh, so for instance, Soresto collars are something I had used for years and years, been really happy with them. And um, I guess in 21, the Environmental Working Group was suing the manufacturer to have them taken off the market because the forever chemicals, the PFASs, were responsible for making many pets sick and I think killing something like 1,780 dogs and cats. And that's horrible. But for the number of doses sold, that's a really small percentage. 
The other really super sad thing is that you have been breathing, drinking, and eating more PFASs than will ever be on your dog. And that's just horrifying. So I think it's important to use them responsibly, to use as many natural op uh, options as possible, but to recognize that sometimes you just got to use them. Uh, so I think, you know, if you can do uh, environmental control using non-toxic mm. substances like um, the, the larvae that will eat the flea eggs and the Name larvae, um, mm. that's awesome. And then for heartworm prevention, um, again, in South Carolina, I saw a lot of clients that used heartworm nosodes, and unfortunately, many of their pets ended up developing heartworm. So I think there's some other products out there that may work better. But even the American Heartworm Society has said that um, you can use the heartworm preventives every 60 days at this point. So again, you know, you've got to really think your way through this. And if you're worried about a specific thing like heartworm disease, leptospirosis, whatever it is, Google uh, heartworm incidence map and then look at your area. Mm -hmm. and see, you know, is it a big problem here or is it, it not a big problem? And then you can make a better informed decision from there. That's a good point. Because even here, living in the city, we don't have as many mosquitoes as people that live outside the city on acreage. You know, if mm -hmm. they've got pond property um, or even a pond in your backyard, you know, so and is it an indoor, you know, dog or cat versus one that, you know, is staying outside? for a good part of the day to be smart. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, with everything, you have to calculate, you have to think about what that individual pet's exposure risk is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So I, you know, there, there are so many things that I would love to ask you about, <laughs> Dr. Ruth. Um, I know I, I recently had, um, someone on my other podcast and, and I posted a clip on TikTok and people have been going nuts on this clip on TikTok lately because it's about um, rabies exemptions mm. and um, how difficult it is because of the standard of care. And a lot of people listening may not know what this is. So I'm just going to quickly say, you know, there's a such thing as duration of immunity. So be aware of that. If you want to Google that, Google that. Um, and having, you know, an immune response in the body doesn't know it's not going to magically go, okay, I'm gone in 365 days. <laughs> right. Um, but so many people are commenting on this particular TikTok that they have had animals that have gotten cancer at injection sites, that they have had to have limbs removed on their animals, that they um, have had anim multiple animals with vaccine reactions and their veterinarians are telling them they still have to come back the next year and get that vaccine again. What recommendations do you have? I know, you know, I, I try to in uh, encourage people to learn more about titer testing and getting vaccine exemption certificates, but what kind of... Um, advice to you because this is one of the most basic things like if people do nothing else with their animals they're generally taking them in every year to get their their yeah. oh my my animal is due for their vaccines so what what do you how, how would you approach that how would you advise a pet parent to approach their veterinarian in these situations it, and this is tough and unfortunately this is where a lot of veterinarians will get their backs up and then you're you know you're in this um <laughs> this death grip situation. <laughs> um, and, and it's, it's really sad because I think back in 1993, Ron Schultz published, and he is the godfather of vaccine research, um, published the first paper that showed that most of the vaccines that we use commonly, distemper parvo for dogs, uh, adenovirus herpes, and then the upper respiratory viruses for cats, the duration of immunity was at least three years. And then we start to see some drop off in protective levels at four years and five years. Now, Dr. Uh, Schultz and Dr. Gene Dodds did the rabies challenge study. And I, are you all familiar with that? 
Mm-hmm. And, and in Dr. Schultz's mind, um, if you can show that the duration of immunity is still good at seven years, he believes that animals are, and people are protected for life. And so what happened is the titer numbers look great for everybody up through the third year. And at the fourth year, they dropped by 20%. And at the fifth year, they dropped another 15 or 20%. And so, you know, this, they were very disappointed. We all were because we were hoping like, Oh, wow, this would be awesome. If we can show that really the duration of immunity lasts for a long period of time. So the difficulty is. They, they said, okay, maybe there's enough just sort of general immune response that these pets would still be protected by cell-mediated immunity. And so they actually went to the USDA. They had a rabies challenge study done, and they all of the pets were still protected at five years, but the USDA would not allow them to call it a valid study Because in order for that to happen, 90% of the unvaccinated animals must develop rabies when challenged with the live virus. And unfortunately, only 89% did. So it's a a tough one. And um, the other thing is that most veterinarians never read the compendium of rabies vaccination. And in 16, um, the compendium mentioned that titers could be indeed acceptable for showing that this dog has protection against rabies virus. The other thing they said was that if a dog or cat has ever been vaccinated for rabies, it is considered up to date and will have the same 10 day at home quarantine. And then at that point, the Department of Health officials would ask for revaccination. Hmm. So wow. there's all of that. Titers do titers. And again, what is your pet's exposure risk for things that are not core vaccines? And, and if you know, we go if you go over to my website, there's a, um, a blog and I think there's a couple of videos on YouTube discussing core, non-core vaccine schedules, all that good stuff. Uh, but it's one of those things. Um, I've had clients telling me that their veterinarian is refusing to see them if they don't update the rabies vaccine. And when it's the only vet in a small town, that gets really tough. So you have to tread delicately. And um, if you have the option to see another veterinarian that's a little bit more amenable to this idea, or if you have a pet that's had cancer or autoimmune disease, there are several papers out there that show that in most situations, vaccines are contraindicated because the immune system is not responding appropriately. And, you know, so it's a real, it's a difficult thing. Um, I will tell you that if for the majority of my clients that use Thuja post-vaccine, the number of vaccine reactions, both short-term and long-term, go down dramatically. And the other thing is, so for instance, we travel quite a bit in Mexico because rabies is very, very bad there still. They still require a one-year vaccine. In European continent, uh, one-year or three-year vaccine is mandatory. There are no tighter options. And so this is where it's super important to use something like Thuja to help the immune system get rid of the, the stuff that's not going to be good. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So prepare. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. Prepare. Yeah. It's yeah. all about preparing. Yeah. Dr. Yes. Roberts, what about the cases? This is where I've, I've, this is what gets me irritated. They don't take into a fact that there are T cells that are memory cells. And just because you have a, a, you know, points drop on a titer doesn't mean that that pet can't mount an immune response. If faced with, you know, these bitten or, you know, whatever, that's just so frustrating to me. It doesn't mean that they're not protected. It just means that the body doesn't see that there's a reason to be, you know, hypervigilant right now because there's no threat. Because Yeah, they haven't been challenged, well, so they kind of wane. Yeah. You know? And, 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 
so so there's kind of two things there. They may or may not be protected. So and what I just mentioned, what you said, the T cells, that's part of the cell mediated immunity. And so that sort of the memory, cellular memory without a specific um, antigen. Yeah. Sometimes they are protected. Sometimes they're not protected. Mm-hmm. And so that's the difficulty. And the problem with rabies is that it is 99.9% fatal. And that's, I mean, you know, do you remember the movie Old Yeller? Yes. Mm-hmm. And with, yeah, the hydrofo. I mean, this was, this was a disease that yeah. until mm, the mid 40s was killing a lot of animals and people. So it's, it's a tough one. It's a really difficult yeah. one. And it still is it killing isn't. people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In, not what, in the U.S. Listen, and Canada so much, but other in other countries, yeah. there are humans that get rabies every year because of exposure to largely dogs and cats. Yeah, right. So it's the tough. other thing that yeah, the other thing that frustrates me is that when pets are going in for like a dental exam or dental cleaning, and they're like, "No, you have to have the rabies vaccine before we can work on your your pet's teeth." Because they're telling pet parents that they might, you know, they're at risk for getting rabies, but that's not how disease works. They can't, I mean, they're not being bitten by a rabid animal doing a dental exam. I just did. And that's, and that's the thing, you know, it's again, it, I, I agree with you. I mean, that is one of the more <laughs> ludicrous things that I've been hearing lately, too. It's like the way this lady's cat has not been outside in 12 years so what's the real exposure risk for rabies and that's that's a problem um and this is it you know if you're in a one vet town yeah you're you're kind of you're there and so again you know be prepared with or or lysium or whatever your favorite um anti-vax or yeah. vaccine protection that's what i tell set people all is. the time yeah, just yeah. prepare in advance to detox if you so, live in right. this common state. Yeah, for those special yep. people like us who <laughs> are just super into the actual science of it, um, aren't there tests, not the titer test, but aren't there other tests? They are much more expensive, I understand, that you can test the T-cell immunity if a titer test if you if you've had a titer that was positive and then you have a titer later in life that no longer shows immunity, aren't there T cell tests to to show? There are T cell tests, but they're not they're not commercially available, and that's the problem. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's <laughs> the that's the difficulty. We don't know, uh, and and that's the thing is, does this animal have not have a valid titer because it's titer dropped because it actually has some protection from cell mediated immunity or it's a vaccine non-responder and this is the first titer mm-hmm. test and we have no idea and that's the difficulty yep it just seems like in some areas we haven't come out of the dark ages like how much of this, they haven't revamped their modalities since the 1940s when it was a problem. I think if you fast forward the last 50, 60 years, you're going to see that those incidences of people and pets catching rabies, especially in areas that are not, you know, known for having rabid animals or whatever. I don't, I think they're, they're lumping it all into the same bucket, you know, a one size fits all approach. They're not looking at it like those people are still living in the dark ages versus this pair you know this part of the this part of the community or this part of the the united states we don't have a rabies problem over here but other parts of the country may it may be more prevalent or whatever like you said so i just think they kind of lump it all into one thing and that's their big excuse they they're not looking at it like look how far we've come in the last 50 years we're doing the same thing we did back then is that necessary i don't think so I think you have to relook at it just like Dr. Rob wants to do a, you know, the rabies vaccine by weight of the animal versus just a one size fits all. That makes sense versus but, the way they do well, things now. Interestingly, it, it makes sense, but Dr. Schultz actually researched it. And what he found was it's, it's kind of like CBD. When you're dosing it appropriately, the goal is to get the immune system to respond. And so mm-hmm. he would give 
uh, you know, one tenth of a cc to a chihuahua, and it would not create an adequate vaccine response, create an antibody response. He could give that tenth of a cc to a Great Dane, and in some cases it would. And this is the mm-hmm. difficulties. We don't know how much antigen it takes to stimulate that individual pet's immune system. So this is, I mean, it makes sense intuitively that, you know, a 10 pound Mm -hmm. dog doesn't need a whole CC, but unfortunately it's not about body weight. It's about how much antigen does it take to stimulate the immune system. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately that ship sailed. Dr. Schultz did that research probably back in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. Wow. So until so, until somebody can come up with an exact way of determining ahead of time how much this particular pet needs, that's where the money maker would be. Anybody? Yeah. Anybody yeah. Ever trying to figure and that out? This one is out? the problem: is that vaccines don't make enough money for the drug manufacturers, and this no. is this is what. This is why there's not a lot of change in the way vaccines are made in veterinary medicine. Um, you know, we had recombinant vaccines come out in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, and that was a big step up because we got better protection with with less, much less side effects. And so, mm-hmm. but that's kind of the last innovation in in protecting pets against disease. And and unfortunately, it's still out there. I mean, rabies, rabies is not as much of a problem, but it's there. Parvo's definitely a problem still. Distemper, mm-hmm. not so much. So it's just, yeah. yeah. So I think maybe to wrap up the, the vaccine question, um, do you recommend, I know a lot of other veterinarians that I follow recommend if you do have to get vaccines, don't do the combos. Is that something you also recommend? Yeah, ideally. And this is the other difficulty is there are a distemper fraction, a parvo fraction, but most veterinarians don't use them. And they're oddly, they're more expensive than the combo. When I, so mm-hmm. the combo that most folks are stuck with is distemper, parvo, adenovirus. Um, and pan leukopenia. So, I'm sorry, that's cats. Um, I lost the P. Uh, pneumonitis. What? So the, that one, you know, it is what it is. But don't do that and lepto and rabies all in the same day, you know, and probably not lepto at all, but split them up by two weeks mm-hmm. as, as much as possible. And then use, my, my protocol was always to use Thuja after each vaccine. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So, um, Dr. Ruth, thank you so much. I don't, I, I want to be respectful of your time. I know it's getting late where you are. <laughs> um, this was enlightening. Thank you so much. And I, I think just to kind of maybe sum it up, um, for you listening at home, be prepared, do research on your own, but also talk to your veterinarian and, um, create a, t- you know, take notes, Ask to record if you can um, this the, your consultation so you don't forget anything. Ask ask the questions. Ask all the questions, and if you have more questions, follow up with questions. <laughs> right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. And I would just add that if you feel bullied in any way, feel free to walk out the door and don't go back. I mean, that was me. I've been bullied by a vet before, and I I just you know you vote with your pocketbook. I don't resonate with that person. I'm not going to be treated like that. So you just, you just have to have that, that courage, you know, it's like, we don't jive just like you, Janet, with that particular, you know, vet just like, you know what, we're, we're not on the same page here. I need to go find a different person to work with. And that's okay. Yeah. you know, it, It's okay. And to your point, when they did, they called back with the, the uh, cytology report to confirm that it was the um, anal sac carcinoma that they believed it to be. Um, I did let them know. I said, please let, you know, Dr. So-and-so know that I have already consulted with another oncologist and I have additional Mm -hmm. um, integrative holistic veterinarians that are on board with the standard of care that we've come up with for Hank. And that was one week's time. I mean, I, you have to hoof it. 
that's what I would say to our <laughs> listeners is that anything that is worth doing um, mm-hmm. and doing well is going to take some commitment of your time. Mm-hmm. Um, but the information is there. And I'm a firm believer in that, you know, ask, ask the question, put it out in the universe, put it on, you know, maybe you have some certain groups that you belong to that are, you know, in our case, we like the holistic integrative, you know, pet groups and we follow many, many veterinarians and researchers, um, so that we can trust the information that we're getting, um, you know, you it's going to take a little bit of time, but once you get those core questions and the research done, it's done. And I also believe that, um, like Jessica always says on the Pet Parenting Reset, when we know better, we do better. Um, and to that point, the other side of that is, you know, don't ever feel bad, guilty, whatever that adjective may be, um, that you didn't know something that you know now, because we're always evolving we're always growing and what you may ask your vet at your next visit. Um, it may change the next time around because research and studies and, you know, we're always learning. Exactly. So Dr. Ruth, if people are not already following you, then I don't know what's wrong with them, but if if they're not already (laughs) following you, how can they find you? It's simple. We're, we're at drruthroberts.com is the website. We're on Facebook. Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. We've got a tremendous number of videos on YouTube. Okay. And um, go check that out. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. And yes. for those of you listening, thank you for being here. We appreciate you. And please give your pets some extra love from all of us today. Bye. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Robert. Thank, thank you. you. With pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you.